our faith in him. Amen. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. There is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. You've already won. Come on, we know that today. Think there is no weapon. There is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. You've already won. Yes, Lord. Show me one thing he can do. Show me a mountain he can move. He's the God of the breakthrough and anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can part. He's the God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. It's possible. Come on, put your hands together today. Let's declare. There is a kingdom. Yeah, sing it out. There is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light. And in his kingdom, every dead thing is bound to rise. Oh, God, our Redeemer. Faithful to revive, oh, he will revive. Yes, we know. Show me one thing he can do. Show me a mountain he can move. He's the God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me water. It's possible. Come on, church. We're going to build our faith today. Declare in Jesus' name that all of my fear I will turn into praise. I'll shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance. I will dance out in faith. He will crush disappointment and break. Come on, you sing it out today. All of my fear I will turn hey. As I sing out your name, a victory dance, I will dance out in faith. He will crush disappointment and break every chain. Now all of my fear, I will turn into praise. I'll shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. He will crush disappointment. Show me one thing he can do. Show me a mountain he can move. He's the God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. I know. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can part. He's the God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. It's possible. Amen. We believe that today, that all things are possible with you, Jesus. Lord, we know that there's nothing that you can't do. There's nothing that can't be accomplished. Lord, so with faith, we stand and we declare your name. We speak the name of Jesus today. Oh, there's power in your name. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus Oh, I 
just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus We claim that today, Jesus Cause your name is power your name is healing your name is life so break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire yes Lord. and i just want to speak the name of jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression i speak jesus come on let's sing that again declare it over your life today we sing i just want to speak the name of jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by depression, I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every song, shine through the shadow. faith we sing today we shout jesus from the mountains jesus in the streets jesus in the darkness over every enemy jesus for my family i speak the holy name jesus only one name we shout Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Come on, build your faith in him today. Oh, so shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the darkness over it. Oh, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Yes, cause your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life. Sing out, we shout Jesus, we shout Jesus in his place. Oh, shout Jesus from the mountain, Jesus in the street, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name, Jesus. Jesus 
trust in you today. Lord, we declare that you are faithful. Lord, through every season, every circumstance, you are faithful. Thank you, Lord.
preparing this song this week, I was thinking a lot about just how, not only how grateful I am for my own personal testimony, what God has done in my life, how his goodness just chases after me, but I'm also so grateful for the brothers and sisters in Christ that I have who have amazing stories to tell. Every single person in this room who has a relationship with Jesus has a story to tell. And not all of us are public speakers. We're not all comfortable with a mic or in front of a big crowd or even a small crowd, but you have a story to share. And so if it just means calling a friend and taking them out for coffee, you know, posting it on Facebook, just sharing snippets of your story. There are many ways that you can share the goodness of God and what he has done for you and holding on to that gratitude in your heart. And so we're just gonna sing this one more time and just give all our praise to the Lord. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a about praising God and it says as a deer pants for streams of water so my soul pants for you my God my soul thirsts for God for the living God when can I go and meet with God my tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long where is your God these things I remember as I pour out my soul how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my savior, my God. We have a lion in our lungs crying out praise, not because we are powerful, but because our God is. He deserves every ounce of our praise. And whether we are downcast, we remind ourselves of who our God is this morning. So if you're in a position that you're like, I just don't know if I can honestly praise God, I wanna challenge you, praise God through it. Praise him through it. No matter what you're going through, praise God, find a reason. You woke up this morning, there's your reason. Jesus, I wanna say thank you, God. 
God, we praise the name above every single name in this place, that Jesus is the one that saves. He's the one that breaks chains. God, that we know that there is hope still left in your name, that there is life in your name, that there is healing in your name, that there is purpose in your name, that you are the name above every single name. So Jesus, we praise you today, God, and we ask right now, Lord, that you would help center our hearts on the truth, on you, Jesus. God, allow us to get away from our feelings. God, let us sink into the truth that you are the God who loves us, that had spared not even your son for us to know you. God, we love you and we praise you this morning. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. As we get ready to go into a very powerful word this morning, why don't you greet everyone around you, welcome them home, tell them what God's doing. say welcome home to every single one of you. I am Pastor Paige and I'm the youth pastor here. So if you don't know me, <laughs> there it is. Love you, Tracy. Um, any hoozles, I just want to say welcome. If you're new here this morning, could you do me a favor? We want to get to know you and welcome you home. There is a card in the seat back in front of you. If you could fill that out for us, you have the opportunity to either put it in the offering bucket as you come on by. Otherwise, you can go to our next steps area out in the lobby where we have a gift for you. And if you're joining us online, we just want to say thank you. Welcome home as well. Uh, if you're new online, tell us where you're from. Uh, we would love to send you a gift as well just for worshiping with us this morning. Church, I know that we're probably really tired of me always announcing our missions night this last couple weeks that you've been in church, but I just want to do a shameless little plug for you guys. This Wednesday, our next gen, so that is kids and youth combined, have the opportunity to raise money for our missions. Um, we give to Speed the Light and BGMC, and everything that is given this Wednesday is gonna be matched. So every dollar is multiplied. And so not only do we get the opportunity to dunk our pastors and make sure that pastor gets dunked like 50 times, that's my goal, um, but there's gonna be opportunities for bounce houses, food, games. So this is something for every single one of you. So if you're like, I wasn't invited, look me in the eye, you're invited. Right now you are invited this Wednesday. So I hope to see you guys there. But I'm gonna invite our ushers to come on down and we are gonna get ready for our offering this morning. And again, I just wanna say thank you guys for giving faithfully. Our youth um, have already given $15,000 to speed the light. And so I just wanna say thank you for showing them and leading the way. Um, our youth see you guys give faithfully and I know that it's catching. And so I just wanna say thank you for tithing. Thank you for being obedient. Thank you for giving. Uh, I can't say thank you enough. Well, maybe I can, but anyways, I'm gonna pray for us and yeah. Jesus, I just wanna say again, thank you for the opportunity that we get to give. God, thank you for the good gifts that you've given us. And God, I just pray right now, Lord, that as we tithe and as we give of our offering today, God, that you would multiply it. God, it would go to the needs that you see, Jesus, that we would be obedient in everything, God. We love you and we praise you this morning. And it's in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.
Welcome home. My name is Pastor Paige and I'm the youth pastor here at Sioux Falls First. We love having each of you here worshiping with us. Whether it's your first time or if you've been participating with us for years, we just want to say welcome home. Online campus, we have a pastor who's right there with you. Say hi in the comment section and tell us where you're joining us from. Your online pastor can pray with you, answer your questions that you might have throughout the service this morning. Would everyone take a second now to share our live stream on your feed? This is an easy way to help your friends, family be encouraged and hear about God's love for them. Discover more about us on our website, SiouxFallsFirst.com, including how to get involved in joining our dream team, to volunteer, or to get connected in a variety of different areas. See details of all our upcoming events throughout our social media, Facebook, Instagram platforms, as well as our website. Here's a preview of what's coming up. I am beyond excited for this Wednesday, our next gen night for missions. On Wednesday the 26th from 6.30 to 8 p.m., we're gonna have food, drinks, all for donations. We're gonna have games, bounce houses for all ages, and the opportunity to dunk some of our pastors. Yep, you get a chance to plunge our staff into the water as we raise donations for Speed the Light and BGMC, Boys and Girls Missionary Challenge, so countries around the world can hear about the hope of Jesus and receive clean drinking water. This is your chance to dunk the staff. I do want to encourage you guys that we have the opportunity to have matching funds for this event. So every dollar that is given, we will be able to raise up to $3,000 extra. So please get involved. We would love to have you there. Senior adults, on August 18th, we're thrilled to have Ernie Haas and the Signature Sound right here in concert. Sign up in the church office and pay our group's discounted ticket price. Invite a friend to do the same as we enjoy a fun concert together. Our Women's Enough Conference will be here in September soon. Help make it happen by volunteering through our website today, SiouxFallsFirst.com slash registration. Now grab your phone or your device with me so you can interact with our message notes this morning on our YouVersion Bible app. In the app, you can click the word more and then click events to choose either Spanish or English for our message notes provided for you. Or find our message notes on our website. How can we live courageously to be all that we can in this life? Let's actively listen to the message God has for us now to discover more. Amen. Well, good morning, church family. Aren't you happy to be in the house of God today? Amen. Have you enjoyed your summer? Yes. You realize how fast it's going? It felt like yesterday was summer solstice, right? And uh, summer's going fast. But I just want to say thank you for being faithful. Uh, when you're here in town, that you're in the house and you're worshiping, there's nothing that replaces being together. We're grateful for our online campus and that opportunity people have to watch, to check things out um, when they're on vacation. But man, I'm glad when you're here. And, and there's power when you get, uh, when you put the six together and, and you light it on fire. There's a, there's a great burn uh, that happens. And we're so, so glad uh, that you're here today. Um, uh, we welcome again our online campus, uh, online pastor Pete is there today, and if you have any questions, um, he's there to answer them. If you need prayer, he's there for you, and uh, we're glad that you are here. I encourage everyone to share your feed. Uh, we talk about that, how it might be something that would be a blessing to other people as well. I just want to mention that um, next week um, is Mega Sports Camp, and um, if you've not yet got your kid or maybe a neighbor kid registered, I encourage you to do that. You can talk to Pastor Sarah. You can talk to Jenny. Um, but I want you to be praying. Anytime we have the opportunity to do any kind of outreach, and Mega Sports Camp is an amazing outreach, um, that we are really, really saturating that in prayer, uh, that God would open the hearts of kids, um, that even families, parents would be impacted. How many know that um, it could only take one moment to change a family tree forever? And, uh, and then I want you to be praying with me for that. And uh, we are excited about Mega Sports Camp. If you have your Bibles or devices, would you go ahead and turn uh, to the book of Joshua, chapter 7. Joshua, chapter 7. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. God, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to, to gather here today. God, for those that are online. God, I thank you for the word of God that is powerful. I pray that the, the, the word of God would impact people's lives forever today. And uh, God, even as we are navigating through the, 
the book of Joshua. God, I pray that as we come to chapter 7, that you would communicate the principles, God, that we need to learn out of this story, that we would be able to apply them. God, that we would not just be hearers of the word, uh, God, but we would be doers of your word. I pray that you would change us today. Father God, I pray across this building and kids ministry and youth ministry and our life change groups in the cafe and conversations, Lord, that you would lead and direct this day, that you would have your way in people's hearts, God. Help us today to lean in to the word and allow you to speak to us. God, it's not just a word that's for somebody else. It's a word that's for me. Lord, we receive it today. In Jesus' name. And everybody shouted amen. 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 Well, how many of you are ready for football season? Anybody? Got your team? I mean, we believe the Chicago Bears are going to win the Super Bowl this year. (laughs) Um, How many could care less about football season, right? Man, a lot of you. Okay. I expect you to be here then during church and not watching football, right? Congratulate the Sioux Falls Storm. They weren't supposed to win last night. They were way behind, came back and won, right? Yeah, I watched that game, great game. They're still in the playoffs. Um, But maybe you remember this noteworthy moment for those that are old enough in NFL history. It was 2002, and there was only a few seconds left in the game between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Cleveland Browns Cleveland Browns were leading just by two points. With the ball at the 40-yard line, KC had one last chance to win the game. Quarterback Trent Green was instantly under pressure after the snap, and as a last-ditch effort, he threw the ball back to one of his offensive linemen. For a second, it appeared John Tate might make history as he had this huge open field to work. But how many know offensive linemen can't move as fast? And he ended up getting pushed off the field at about the 30-yard line. And the game was over, supposedly. How many know it's important not to celebrate too early, right? And so Dwayne Rudd was the player who put him under pressure. Thinking he had gotten a sack, he took off his helmet and threw it in celebration. And as we all know, that's not allowed. Rudd was given a 15-yard unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, setting up a short field goal for Kansas City that won the game by one point. Wow. What a fluctuation of emotions on the field that day. I'm sure everyone felt it. And I think it's similar to what Joshua was feeling in Joshua chapter 7. In fact, if you could term Joshua chapter 6 as the thrill of victory at Jericho, then Joshua 7 could be called the agony of defeat at Ai. That literally in a moment's time, the mood in the camp changed because of the decision of one man by the name of Achan. Excited to continue our series on the life of Joshua today, talking about the dangers of hidden sin. Now, how many know when you preach through a book of the Bible, you preach what it says, right? And and Joshua 7, in a lot of ways, isn't really easy for us to hear. It's something maybe a little more difficult to navigate through, and yet God is so good that he is willing to speak truth to the areas of our life that need it, and he will continually speak that truth to our hearts to bring transformation and change. I want you to read with me Joshua chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. It says, But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not have all the people go up, 
but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they, the enemy, is few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, they, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes, fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. He and the elders of Israel said, Alas, Lord my God, why have you brought the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond or the other side of the Jordan. Man, what a, what a story here. Understanding that Israel had just experienced a remarkable victory at Jericho where they routed uh, the city. They literally took possession of it and uh, in their conquest of Canaan. And so now they felt their next opponent, this small and less defended town of Ai would be no problem. To the point where the ones that spied it out came back and told the commander Joshua, they said, hey, we don't even need to send many people there. I would send two, maybe 3,000 soldiers and it's gonna be an easy victory. It's not gonna take long. And, and, and so that's exactly what he did. However, they not only didn't win the battle, they were absolutely clobbered. What should have been an effortless win became a complete disaster, a dehumanizing, demoralizing defeat. And, and as I was reading through this, it's amazing the difference a day can make, right? It's, a, it's amazing how just in a moment's time that, that everything can change, and we see that here. And, and so Joshua was thinking to himself, how could this have happened? Lord, why did you lead us over the Jordan? Why did you lead us to defeat Jericho and now be defeated by the Amorites? He, he tore his clothes, he dropped to the ground, he cried out to God, God, how could this have happened? Little did he realize at that very moment that the hidden sin of Achan caused this setback. If you remember last week, we read the instructions that God specifically gave the nation of Israel for when they would go in and take Jericho. Here's what he said in chapter six, verse 18 and 19. He said, but you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction. Lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble on it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So God is very clear. He says, listen, as, as tempting as it may be, don't take of anything, not the silver, not the gold, not the clothes. Take nothing because those things are to be devoted to the Lord. You are to separate yourselves from them. But we know this is not what happened. This is not what happened. And then God really reveals to Joshua that there is sin in the camp, that there was disobedience to this command. So God gives Joshua instructions on how to find the culprit of their demise. So we pick up the story. I want you to go chapter seven down to verse 16. It says in verse 16, Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought near the clans of Judah and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. And he brought near the clan of the Zerahites man by man and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household man by man and Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord of God of Israel and give praise to him. And tell me now, what have you done to do not hide it from me? And Achan answered Joshua, truly I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And this is what I did when I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar 
and 2,000 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. Then I covered them and took them and see they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. And so we, we see this tremendous move from victory to defeat because of one man's sin. And I believe today as we open our heart to God, we, we pull our shield down and, and say, God, speak to me, communicate to me. I believe God is going to speak some life-giving truth to you and I. And, and I wanna share the, an acrostic based on this story to help us grasp the dangers of sin. Number one is the deception of sin. So what is sin? I think it's important in the society we live in today to define sin. Sin in the Greek is hamartia, and it literally means to miss the mark. Sin is any, any thought, any word, any action that goes against God's word, God's commands, God's desires. You see, Achan understood the directives that God had given the nation of Israel concerning the devoted things, that they were not supposed to touch them. Even though he knew the target, he made the decision to rebel against God's instructions. Why? Because he was deceived. And I think it's very interesting in verse 21, we see this process of deception that happens in the life of Achan and how deception gained access to Achan's heart. And man, last night as I was praying and preparing and, and, and kind of going over my message, I couldn't help but get Billy Ray Cyrus out of my head. <laughs> Don't tell my heart, my aching, breaky heart. <laughs> I just don't think he'd understand, right? There was deception. And we know Satan always traffics in deception. Look what happens. Number one, he saw. He, he saw those things that were appealing to his flesh. He saw those things that he really wanted. And then secondly, he, he coveted, we see in verse 21. So he began to covet them. I, I really want them. They, they, they really don't belong to me, but I want them. I know God said that I'm not supposed to have them, but I'm coveting them. And then he takes them, right? And, and then lastly, he hid them. I will tell you that this is almost always the process that the enemy uses on us. Now, it's important to note that temptation is not sin. So just by seeing those things, that was not sin. Just the initial glance that Achan had of those things that he wanted, hey, the silver and the gold and the clothing and all those things that he really wanted, the initial look was not the sin. It is, it is when he made a decision to covet and take them. You see, these things had a stronger pull on his allegiance than to the commands and the directives of God. James 1, 14 and 15 puts it this way. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. You see, sin originates with a desire. Sin originates with a thought. And friends, when we know that's happening and the Spirit of God is convicting us, here's what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to captivate that thought and kill that thought and then... Sin dies unborn. That's exactly what happens. But sin is when desire is conceived or when we act upon it. And what typically happens, because we are walking in deception, is we begin to rationalize. We begin to justify our behaviors. We, we begin to give excuses for our sin that is contrary to God's word, under, not really understanding that we are being deceived by the enemy. Here's what you need to know. The enemies come simply to steal, kill, and destroy. He'll come any way he can. He'll come through the back door. He'll come through the front door. He'll show up in the parking lot. The enemy will come, and he will come in ways that will be appealing to your flesh and my flesh. And as we act upon it, we then become deceived. We then attempt to hide our sins or even manage our behavior, our perceptions that other people have of us, of what's happening in our lives. It reminds me of, of what happened in the Garden of Eden. You remember when the snake came in the garden, Lucifer came in the garden and began to deceive Adam and Eve 
Um, remember, he told them that, hey, you know what? I know that the Lord has, has said this is not allowed. This is off limits. But the reason is that you will be like God. You'll begin to think like God. There'll be benefits to it. And uh, the enemy didn't say, hey, this is an ugly thing. Don't touch it. He said, it's appealing. And this is gonna be good for you. And so as they enter into deception and they sin, they fell, the fall of man, what we see there is immediately they begin to sew fig leaves together in order to uh, cover the shame of their sin. You see, they thought it would conceal their rebellion against God, but it didn't. Here's what happened, and the same thing happens to us. It only created an illusion that continued to isolate us from real intimacy with God. You see, God wants intimacy with you. God wants to walk with you during the cool of the day and the cool of the evening. God desires intimacy and relationship with you. That's why God hates sin so much. Because sin alienates, sin separates us from God. Sin moves us from the divine purposes that God has for our lives. That's why he hates sin. Now here's the good news about temptation because all of us here today are tempted. Every single one. Don't let the enemy come to you and say, hey, you know what, you're tempted more than everybody else. Don't, don't let him lie to you saying, you know what, this is kind of unique and you're different and, and, and this temptation is, uh, is something that just applies to you. No, here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. But you gotta read on. It says, God is faithful. What context did he write that in? In the context of temptation. When you and I are facing temptation, when the shiny lights are, are, are trying to appeal to our flesh nature, it says that God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Man, that's good news today, right? Because here's what the enemy's told some of you. I can't, I can't help it. I can't control myself. You know, it's, it's something that just happens. And here's what, here's what God says. Every time we face temptation, there's an exit door. We just have to look for it, right? We, we have to look for the temptation, for the exit door that is, that is, that is there in the midst of our temptation. In fact, uh, I, I think it's interesting, the Lord's Prayer. You know, we, we know it's also termed the, the disciples' prayer. Jesus gave us this model prayer, this outline to, to be able to pray and to seek his face. And, and in the midst of that prayer is this prayer, is, are these words. Lead me not into temptation. And you know, I realize I probably don't pray that prayer enough. That when, when you wake up in the morning and you're facing your day and you realize that the enemy is putting a minefield before you, the enemy knows what appeals to your flesh. The enemy knows your weak areas. He knows the chinks in the armor that he can, that can, he can get in and, and, and work his death, work his destruction, work his defeat in your life. That we need to say, Lord, today as I begin my day, God, I pray you lead me not into, but lead me away from temptation. God, show me the exit door. God, I'm believing today that you're gonna give me victory as I walk through this day. And even though there's an assignment of the enemy on my life, it's gonna be canceled because I depend on you and I'm calling on you and you're gonna help me even in the midst of temptation. Amen. Don't let the enemy talk you out of your victory. He, call, he tells us to pray that we're not deceived by the attraction of sin. Secondly, we see the impact of sin. I want you to notice God's response to Joshua when he asked why they'd been defeated. He said, Israel has sinned. You can read verse 11 and 12. He, he uses the word, Israel has sinned. They, they have sinned. They've done this. And yet God was speaking about the sin of Israel, but only revealed that one man sinned. What is God saying to us in this passage? That when one person sins we all suffer the consequences. That while there is hidden sin, there's no such thing as private sin. You don't sin in a silo. In fact, that's how the enemy has really caused some of you to jump into that temptation and, 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 and an appeal to your flesh is that you know what, what you're doing is not hurting anybody. What you're doing is not impacting anybody else. 
And the enemy wants you to have tunnel vision instead of seeing the impact that it can have on your family, on your marriage, the impact it can have on your church, on our testimony, on the testimony of Christ in our community. He doesn't want us to see that. Well, every evil word and action that's produced in us impacts the lives of those around us. That's why Paul asked the rhetorical question. In 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6, he says, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? If you have just a small amount of yeast in your dough, it will work its way through the whole thing and it will rise. You see, that's the, that's the nature of sin. Even when people are diagnosed with cancer, that they will go to extremes to have surgeries and have chemo because they want to eliminate, they want to eliminate every disease cell. Because if we allow a little, it can, it can take over. It can affect the body. The same way sin can affect the entire body. Sin has a far-reaching impact, and that's why it must be dealt with. In fact, I was thinking about the words that Jesus speaks, and, you know, the world already thinks we're crazy, right? But then you say things like this, that Jesus said, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, right? If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. And we know that's strong language, right? And it's really hyperbole that Jesus uses to show us that we should engage in radical measures to eliminate sin from our hearts and our lives so it doesn't take over, so it doesn't bring destruction, so it doesn't impact those around us. And so today, I know it's not a popular message, but it's in Joshua 7. And we're sharing this because I know that God loves us so much that he doesn't just give us a portion, that he gives us the whole counsel. In fact, I remember as a youth pastor and uh, much less wisdom was reigning in my body. And uh, I, I got this idea, this illustration, and I found an old Bible that had been on the church uh, coat rack for like years. And it was already kind of ripped up and everything. And I thought, you know, I'm gonna... Um, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna ask forgiveness instead of getting permission. But I, I get up and I'm preaching about um, this, this attraction to sin and how sometimes even in our own lives, we, we, uh, we look at scriptures and we say, you know what, I don't really like that one. Have you been there? You ever read it and go, man, I don't like that one. And, and so usually the ones we quote and the ones we speak about a lot are the ones we like. The other ones we kind of, kind of push off, right? And so I, I stood up and I thought, you know, this is, these kids are going to forever me, remember this. I took that Bible and I said, man, I don't like this uh, scripture on sexual sin. I cut it out and threw it down. Did the kids, I mean, like, like you're doing that to the Bible, right? And, and then I go over and talk, you know, the, the scriptures on gossip. And man, you know what, I, I, but, I, but I like that. And, and so I cut that out and threw it down. And finally, after several things that we had talked about and in and, and, and those areas, I said, now I have a Bible I like. Now I have a Bible that applies to me. And I said, some of you are freaking out that I just did that, but that's what you do every day. That's what you do every day when you approach your life and we journey through uh, life is that you literally cut out parts of the scripture and try to adapt the word of God to fit your lifestyle instead of allowing the word of God to change your life. And because of that, it's impacting you. And because of that, it's impacting others. And thirdly, is this. Is, is the end result of sin. So it's interesting that there was only one defeat in their conquest of Canaan, and it was this little underdog community of Ai. And yet the army of Ai that was less defended, less prepared for battle, they killed 36 of the Israeli soldiers because Achan took of the devoted things. Those things that he wasn't supposed to touch. Achan and his family were also stoned to death by the army of Israel as a consequence for his hidden sin. You can read about that in Joshua 7, 24 through 26, but really it's this. It's a symbol of what happens to us spiritually when we engage in perpetual sin. Now let me just say this. We sin, we're convicted, 
we cry out to God. First John 1 John 1.9 says that he is faithful to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we keep marching towards Christ-likeness, right? We keep marching towards Christ-likeness. But when we allow things to be kept in our tent, things, things that are hidden, if we allow ourselves to ignore the, the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit who convinces the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, then we, we really begin to experience spiritual death, physical death, emotional death. Our sinfulness naturally results in death. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin, the, the final outcome of sin is death. You see, the end result is found in the acrostic that we've created today. And it's in Ezekiel 18.20, which says the soul who sins shall die. Shall die. I was thinking about Achan, and I was thinking about what happened in his decision-making that caused him to take these things, take them home, dig a hole in his tent, and hide them. I thought, what if the outcome would have been different? What, what, what if he would have said, you know what, I recognize the convicting voice of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to deal with those things. What, what, if, what if he would have repented and said, you know what, I took him, but, and he goes to Joshua, or he goes to the Lord and said, Lord, I shouldn't have done this, and I want to I wanna put them back where they need to go. I'm going I'm to separate myself from those things. What could have happened? I believe that he would have received mercy. I believe he would have received grace as the worship team comes. You know, God loves us with an unrelenting love. He pursues us. Everything he does is for our good, is to give us life. That's who God is. And, and when you sense that conviction, that temptation, and, and you're tempted to give in, know that the Lord is, is not only creating that exit door for you, but he, he is for you. He is walking with you in the midst of that thing that's trying to pull at you and pull your allegiance and bring defeat to you. And the good news is today is that if you are breathing and you're in this room and you're watching online that there is time for you to change course. There's time for you to reverse the effects of sin. So let's get practical. How many like practical things, right? Practically apply the word of God. And there's some of you that need to disengage from people that are causing you to engage in gossip and slander that nobody else may know about because God hears. You know, sometimes oh, it's in the form of a prayer request. And we say, you know what? I'm just letting you know so you can pray for them. That the conviction of the Holy Spirit would come on you. And you say, I'm out. I'm not gonna be part of this. There's some of you today that need to end a dating relationship because it's causing you to sin when you're alone. It's impacting you. It's affecting you. Maybe you would say, you know what? I feel like what we do is not hurting anybody else. Maybe some of you are saying, you know what? Um, we're gonna get married anyway. Some of you may say, you know what? We're, you know, we're, we're living together, but nothing's happening. And you're, you're allowing the enemy to traffic and deception in your life. And what needs to happen is there needs to be repentance. And some of you may just need to end that relationship because it's not building a foundation that you're gonna be able to build your marriage upon, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, at times I'm talking to couples and I, and I know again, this is countercultural. I know this is crazy countercultural, but let me just say this. If you want God to show up in your marriage, then build a foundation during your engagement that will honor him that will respect him, that will love him, that will honor that other person, that we will begin to see people as the sons and daughters of God rather than, than these objects of our flesh that appeal to our flesh. Build a foundation that will last, that will help you, that will, we, hey, we know marriage is hard work. 
We know marriage is really a laboratory of discipleship, but you know what? It's different when you've built a foundation on Christ and said we will honor him and we will serve him and we will live for him. And when we go into marriage, we want that to be honorable to him. Some of you need to install filtering software in your computer to help you when no one's looking because God sees. I'm heartbreaking, I'm heartbroken to read the statistics on how much pornography is in the church. How it's pulling and destroying, annihilating people's lives and hearts. Something that is so detrimental to who we are and how we see ourselves and our name, who God's called us to be. All of us need to ask God to show us those things in our lives that dishonor him so we can repent and change. And listen, you may not even know what that looks like. You may just be like sensing and feeling and man, we're gonna give you opportunity to say, God, anything that's in the way, that stands in the way between me and you, it's not worth it. Would you just say that? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth your relationship with God. It's not worth intimacy. It's not worth your testimony. In fact, let me just say this. If we wanna enter the next season, it's amazing how Joshua is such a picture of our church right now. And man, I'm thinking about these promises that are not far ahead, that God's made over this church, that God's made over your life and your family, that God's spoken. And I'm thinking we're moving that direction. And in the same way the children of Israel had to take care of some things in order to step into the land of promise, there's things we have to take care of. And and, and we gotta read through Joshua 7. You can't go around it. You gotta drive right through Joshua 7. And if we're gonna go to the land of promise, there's some things we have to leave here. And I believe there's some things we're gonna leave here in this house today. There's things we're gonna leave and, and, and not pick up again. Why? Because God wants to heal you of what enslaves you. God wants to set you free. The truth will set you free. You know, one of the greatest needs in America today is recognize sin for what it is. We're too prone to explain it away, soften its repulsion. But there was a minister by the name of Wilbur Chapman who preached on sin. And one of his church members came and to talk to him in his study, he said to the preacher, we don't want you to talk so plainly about sin because the more our boys and girls hear you talking about sin, the more easily they will become sinners. Call sin a mistake if you will, but do not speak so plainly about it being just plain outright sin. The preacher, in in the wisdom that God gave him, took down a small bottle from the shelf marked poison and showed it to his guest. It was a bottle of strychnine and he said, I see what you want me to do. You want me to change the label. Now suppose that I took off the label that's marked poison and I put on a mild label such as the oil of anise. Don't you see what happens? The milder you make the label, the more dangerous you make the poison. Listen, God has established rules for life and he is not part of a democracy. Sometimes we get so democratic in our mindset, this democracy. God is running a theocracy. God has the right as our creator to define the rules and the guidelines that we will live by. And even as much as culture, it's happening now, but even more will pressure us to become more relevant to the times or to become more compassionate, there truly is nothing more loving than communicating the truth and making sure people know what's on the label. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet across this place today as we learn from Achan that sin is extremely serious. And again, God's, God did not come, Jesus did not come to condemn the world. Did you hear that? I pray the heart of this message didn't feel that way. But he came that the world might be saved. And you know what makes this cross so beautiful? Man, did they do a good job on that? What makes the cross so beautiful is because we see the ugliness of our sin and we can't do it on our own, right? 
We, we can't live for God on our own, but the cross is what allows the righteousness of Christ to be imputed in our hearts where we can live for God. We can live righteous. We can live courageously. We can call those things out in our hearts and our lives that need to, need to be dealt with, need to be left here today. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes across this place, Father, in the name of Jesus, speak clearly to your people today. Let him feel that loving voice of God, but clear voice of God that is communicating your heart, your will, your desires for each one of us. If you're in this room today, you're watching online, you say, Pastor Clint, today I realize I need a savior. I'm lost, I'm not serving him. And sometime either during the worship today, during the, the word, you have sensed the conviction of the Holy Spirit saying you need to get your heart right with God. You need to surrender to him. You need to become born again. If that's you, would you lift your hand up and wave at me? Would you just wave at me? Wave at me, say, that's me, Pastor Quentin. I need him, I need him. Anybody here today that would say, that's me? Amen, I see that hand. God bless you, brother. Anybody else? I see that hand. God bless you. Anybody else would say, that's me? Come on, just be honest. Be transparent before God. I, I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. I see that hand. God bless you. I see those Hallelujah, I see all those hands. Several, several, several people. I'd like to ask our prayer team to come, and as they're coming, we're gonna pray. And if you raised your hand, I want you to repeat these, these words after me because they're words that we're giving you just to articulate what's happening in your heart. The Spirit of God is waking you, bringing you to life. And church, nobody should have to pray alone. So would you pray this prayer as well? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for sending Jesus to die for our sins and to resurrect, to completely overcome sin and death. We receive your forgiveness today. We turn away from the old life and we become brand new in you. Lord, today, we are thankful that we can say we're children of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord praise for those who responded to him? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Somebody say, if you prayed that prayer online, reach out to our online pastor. If you prayed in this room, we'd love the opportunity to pray with you. Prayer team would like to pray with you. But here's, here's how I feel like God wants us to end the Spirit of God has spoken to you today as a child of God, as a believer and you're like, man I want to heed his voice and there's things that I want to leave here it could be an attitude it could be some unforgiveness it could be a, a sin of omission it could be a sin of commission but God, there's nothing worth this view right? there's nothing worth God, our relationship and that intimacy and so today, maybe some of you would want to find a place by yourself to pray. Others of you may want to come here to one of our people here and say, you know what, I, I don't exactly know what it all means, but I, I really want prayer to overcome the enemy. Because I feel like the enemy has been, I, I, feel like I've, I feel like I've been in the midst of the, the AI thing. I feel like I've been in the midst of AI defeating me, and I, I want to surrender to God and allow his victory to be revealed in my heart. Maybe you're here today and you have a need of any kind. We are here to pray for you. So as we sing this song of worship, would you respond to the Lord?